Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back to lecture number four in our series here, where we're going to be talking today about scientific racism and how ideas about race have been integral to the development of physical or what's also called biological anthropology. So what's on the agenda? First, we're going to talk a little bit about the science of craniology, which is the study of human skulls and how that's been linked to ideas about race and racism. Then we'll talk about the Darwinian evolution into these conversations about race and evolution and how social evolutionary theories adapted by uh, Morgan uh, and, and other social scientists have um, contributed to these ideas, modern ideas about race and racism. And then we'll talk a little bit about skull collecting here in the United States and its role in the development of physical anthropology and the study of craniology. And then we'll end with a few uh, comments about the way in which physical anthropology has evolved from this early history uh, of scientific racism in the 20th century. So let's begin with scientific racism. So the fundamental subject of physical or biological anthropology is the exploration of human origins and human variation. Professional writings on these topics began in the 18th century, which was also a time when the concept of race was formalized and racial classification systems were proposed. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, a German physician and anatomist, developed a five-fold classification system of human varieties, which included American, Asian, African, European, and what he termed Malay. So Blumenbach's uh, classification really became the foundations of all subsequent forms of anthropological theory around human evolution. And he is widely considered to be the kind of founder of physical anthropology. So Blumenbach applied a kind of biblical view to human diversity. And he argued that people spread around the world after what's chronicled in the Old Testament as the great flood in which Noah built his ark and all the animals are paired off two by two um, and Noah and his family uh, are saved by God and start off this new generation of people. So in Blumenbach's view, he says that differences in phenotype developed in response to different environments as the ancestors of Noah began to spread out across the world from where the ark had originally landed. Now, Blumenbach's essential assumption was that Caucasians were the primary and original race because they had strayed the least distance from the ark's landing point. The Caucasian skull, according to Blumenbach, was most symmetrical and therefore the near perfection of this skull must have been the type first created by God. Blumenbach argued that climate, diet, life weight, and diseases had all contributed to the subsequent degeneration of non-Caucasian races as they spread out across the world uh, over time. So in the U.S., Samuel G. Morton used Blumenbach's five racial varieties to develop the view of multiple racial creation, while also still applying a very similar kind of uh, biblical framework that, that Blumenbach had used. So for Morton, the human skull was basically a kind of highway back in time. It was a way to trace racial differences to their beginning. And he was really the first to apply scientific rigor to racial science through using large sample sizes and replicable measurements. So starting in the 1830s, Morton began to acquire the necessary anatomical specimens 
for his study. And he used his connections with the Philadelphia Academy of Science and the American Philosophical Society to buy skulls that had been dug up from archaeological sites. As smallpox and other epidemics swept across the United States, Native American bodies flooded this, this emerging skull market and were bought up by Morton. So Morton was not only getting archaeological skulls, but also getting contemporary skulls from Native people who died at this time due to disease. By the time Morton died in 1851, he had a cranial library that contained over a thousand specimens and was considered the world's most comprehensive skull collection. Using these skulls, he established the science of craniometry, which is the analysis of skull size and shape. And he published his research in a, a definitive work called Crania Americana in 1839. This work really signaled the beginning of physical anthropology in the United States. So Morton's racial theory was based on the measurements of cranial capacity or what we would call brain size. Cranial capacity is pretty straightforward, pretty simple to measure. You just fill up a skull with something. Uh, Morton used BB size lead shot. You pour out the shot and then you measure the volume. According to this research, Caucasians had the biggest brains with a cranial capacity of 87. Uh, African and African Americans had much smaller brains with only a 78 uh, cranial capacity, while Native Americans fell somewhere in the middle with about 82 CUs. But Morgan didn't just stop at seeing how big people's brains were across these different racial groups. He went on to correlate cranial size and shape with specific mental traits. Morton's, Morton and his colleagues around the world collected skulls for him along with specific data about those individuals' age, sex, race, occupation, and personality traits. Using this demographic data, Morton was able to compare scientific behavioral traits with metric attributes. So he matched up these various different kind of uh, demographic attributes of racial groups with the size of their brains. The core assumption here in Morton's studies was that the brain size is a direct correlate to intelligence and provided a way to explain why one race seemed to act differently from another. So here, Morton is trying to scientifically understand behavioral differences across racial groups by looking at brain size rather than looking at cultural traits. Morton's big kind of conclusion was that the Caucasian skull, uh, because of its large brain size and therefore high levels of intelligence, made Caucasian, the Caucasian race superior. Uh, specifically, Morton said that Anglo-Saxons were at the top of this kind of racial hierarchy with the largest skulls and therefore the most intelligence, followed by Jewish people and then Hindus, who are also classed um, as Caucasian at this time. So for Morton, this hierarchy was basically part of God's kind of divine master plan to place the Caucasian race at the top of the spectrum. So even though Morton and Blumenbach get to this kind of conclusion of Caucasian racial superiority through slightly different methods, the conclusion is still the same, right? This is part of God's plan about how to make uh, society, um, how to normalize kind of hierarchies of power across racial groups. So Morton's work has been critiqued by Stephen Gould during the 1990s in a book called The Mismeasure of Man. So according to Gould, Morton was unconsciously biased because of his belief that some races were inferior to others, 
and because of his belief in what's called polygenism. Polygenism is basically the idea that observed differences between races reflect differences in the quality of intelligence and ability. In contrast, monogenism argued that human races came from a single human origin or creation by God. So both polygenism and monogenism had racist implications, since many monogenists believed that races other than Europeans had degenerated over time to their present inferior state. So Morton's ideas are based in polygenism. Blumenbach's ideas are based in monogenism. Both of them make assumptions about the superiority of Europeans. So the, our uh, participation answer for today, which is Pyramids of Giza. So make sure to go in to D2L and um, write in Pyramids of Giza as the answer to the question, what is the artifact of the day? So just as a quick note about the Pyramids of Giza, what you're looking at here are the three pyramids of Giza, which were built between 2,550 20, years, uh, 2,550 BC, which is considered the Old Kingdom. Uh, and they were built by Pharaoh Khufu, with the tallest pyramid standing about 481 feet. So make sure to fill out your attendance quiz for today. All right, let's get back into the lecture. So the scholarly kind of commitment to biblical frameworks began to change following the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin in 1859. So The Origin of Species introduced the idea that all organisms are descended from a common ancestor, basically a monogeism, and set out a clear explanation for the Earth's biological diversity, which was not rooted in the Bible, but was rooted in Darwin's ideas about natural selection and evolution. So Darwin reasoned that since resources are inherently limited, the young of reproductive age will struggle to survive. Most young don't make it in the long run. But the survivors who do persist do so because they have traits that give them a competitive advantage. These physical variations are passed along to the next generation so that each generation, the number of individuals with advantageous traits will increase. Remember, this is what we talked about with the development of the variation and um, the amino acid linked to linked to the processing of oxygen in areas with malaria, right? So that variation was developed in order to help the young in malaria prone areas to actually survive, but it mutated over time as the populations uh, increased with that mutation to actually become a disadvantage. So the evolutionary process is gradual and continuous, eventually giving rise to new species through what Darwin calls natural selection. So in constructing this theory about the diversity of life, Darwin actually unwittingly provided a scientific rationale for social evolution. 19th century anthropologists took up Darwin's ideas and argued that like all other organisms, people struggle to survive and that the successful ones are the fittest. These anthropologists ranked human societies according to their evolutionary status and argued that all human progress depends on competition. While anthropologists drew on evolutionary theory, theories that ranked human populations, uh, they still kept a lot of the same kind of racial hierarchies that Blumenbach and Morton had used. So one example of an early anthropologist who contributed to ideas about social evolution was Lewis Henry Morgan, who wrote a book called Ancient Societies. 
So this is a point in the class where we would take a break. I would put you guys into small groups and you would talk about some of the features of civilization and what you think the kind of material correlates of those features would be. So if you're watching this at home, take a moment, write down some thoughts about what are the kind of core aspects of a civilization and what are the material um, aspects of those, those civilizations. So Morgan was also trying to come up with measures of civilization so that he could rank human societies along a kind of spectrum. So Morgan did this by working backwards from the present in order to reconstruct the evolution of human societies. Specifically, he looked at what prim primitive societies lacked. So, for example, he looked at anatomical parallels between Neanderthal skulls, which were first found in Germany in 1856, and skulls of living Australian aboriginals who were believed to represent the oldest or most archaic stage of human development. And basically, the idea here was that Western civilization was modern and everyone else was primitive. So following this logic of evolution, more primitive societies represented earlier iterations of Western society. So in ancient societies, Morgan lays out this, this kind of historical set of um, periods in which human societies have evolved in. And he did a lot of his work based on kind of observations of tribes in the United States. So this theory that Morgan used was unilineal, meaning that it was moving in one direction from past to present and had three basic phases with several kind of subcategories within them. The first phase, let's see here. The first phase was hunter gatherers uh, who existed in what, 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 he, what Morgan understood to be savagery. So th this kind of state of savagery was characterized by small scale societies uh, rooted in kinship, uh, a hunting and gathering lifestyle rather than agriculture, um, the kind of use of ephemeral structures, uh, the development of stone tool, bow and arrow technologies, all these sorts of things. The next phase in this kind of evolutionary sequence was barbarism. So barbarism included things like agriculture and metalworking, um, what's often considered the Neolithic revolution, uh, the development of ceramics, the earliest forms of art in the form of rock art, uh, and the construction of more permanent forms of architecture. The final stage here in Morgan's hierarchy was civilization. So this kind of state of civilization involved the development of writing, um, the use of, of alphabets, the um, aggregation of people into larger and larger urban settlements, all the things that we think of and associate probably with major uh, Western civilizations like Rome, right? So at the same time that Morgan was laying out these various stages of savagery, barbarism, and civilization, he also was matching them up with different family and kin structures. And so he basically had this idea that when uh, societies were living in a state of savagery, they engaged in promiscuity, they had polygamy, uh, there was lots of incest, and that over time, as societies became more civilized, uh, uh, marriage and um, the kind of nuclear family structure evolved. So Morgan's theory was very appealing and fit into the Protestant notion of kind of hard work, nuclear, um, 
monogamous families, which was very popular in Victorian Europe and the United States at this time. The racial hierarchies established by Morton and Morgan were used to justify U.S. policies that um, promoted discrimination against African Americans and Native Americans. So these kind of theories uh, justified policies of slavery and assimilation for indigenous and black peoples who were perceived to be less civilized and needed to be brought up to the standards of uh, European civilization. So for both Morgan and Morton, Native Americans played a really critical role in developing their scientific theories. Skull collecting among natural historians in the U.S. seeking to build up museum collections was a common practice during the late 1800s. For instance, in 1865, Louis Agassiz, the director of the Harvard Peabody Museum, petitioned the Secretary of War Edwin Staten for Native American bodies to enlarge the Museum of Natural History collections. U.S. Surgeon General William Hammond compi complied with such requests for bones, ordering medical officers to collect Native remains. As Native communities were being confined to reservations or hunted down by settlers, the bones of their ancestors were systematically gathered up from the battlegrounds, reservation cemeteries, and archaeological sites and shipped to the newly founded Army Medical Museum. These U.S. Army bases became laboratories for the processing of Indian bones and the development of scientific theories about racial inferiority. For, for, um, for example, our old friend Franz Boas was a key figure in these kind of early collecting endeavors. So during the late 1880s, Boaz was employed by the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And he was tasked with conducting a kind of general survey of Native American communities in British Columbia and what is now Canada. And he was particularly supposed to collect linguistic and physical anthropological data. He was also tasked with bringing a collection of native skulls and skeletal parts back uh, to the British Association. So to accomplish this goal, Boaz used a photographer to distract people while he removed remains from their graves. This strategy allowed him to collect about a dozen or so cranial specimens. He then retained the services of a man named William Sutton to actually help him expand this collection so that it could become more complete. Things got a little more heated when the indigenous communities of the area, the Kowachan, discovered that their graves had been desecrated and they actually were successful in obtaining a warrant to search Boaz's collections. But Boaz was able to avoid detection by shipping all of his illicit human remain materials, some nearly 200 crania at this time, to New York, so out of Canada into the United States under a falsified in invoice. In 1889, these bones were actually legally purchased by Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. The skulls that Boaz collected and then were purchased by uh, Clark University were showcased in 1893 at the World Fair where Boaz created a systematic arrangement of Northwest Coast skulls and associated material culture. More popular than his skeletal finds was the exhibit Boaz organized with a dozen Kwakiutl people who built a traditional longhouse in the fair's ethnological zoo. He placed alongside exhibitions of people from the Northwest Coast with those of Apachean, and Diné, as well as Iroquois and families. So Boaz's kind of collecting ventures, I think really demonstrate the intimate relationship between colonization, skull collecting, and the development of anthropological museums, both independent as well as associated with universities. 
So this will be time in the class where we take another break from the lecture. And I would ask you guys to think about whether anthropologists have a kind of ethical obligation to address this history of skull collecting and what solutions you think the discipline should take to addressing this problematic history. So if you're at home, take some time, write down some notes. So during the early 20th century, most research in physical anthropology was carried out in museums like the Smithsonian and the American Museum of Natural History. Beginning in the 1920s, however, physical anthropology as an academic discipline started to expand, primarily under the direction of Ernest Houghton at Harvard University. By the 1950s, physical anthropology had moved away from these kind of descriptive measurements that were used by early scholars uh, like Blumenbach and Morton, as well as social Darwinist theories like Morgan's. And instead, students were much more interested in looking at primates and human evolution, as well as issues of human variation. So this kind of new wave of scholarship was led by Sherman Washburn, who was one of uh, Hooten's students at Harvard. And Washburn became very intrigued about uh, looking at populations rather than racial groups. So we see a shift in the 1950s from looking at racial groups and racial types to looking at populations. So remember when we were talking about DNA research, which emerges in the 1970s, that's really premised on ideas about populations, not necessarily racial groups. So Washburn was a big proponent of this idea for a move towards populations. But of course, the concept of race has really remained and continues to kind of permeate ideas about how to conduct analyses on different types of populations. We definitely see that right in DNA research. So for example, three of Ernest Houghton's students, Carlton Kuhn, Stanley Garn, and Joseph Birdsell, developed a six-fold geographical classification scheme that divided the major racial groups, which had been previously established, into 30 subpopulations, and then identified kind of macro or hybrid populations from those 30 larger subpopulations. So they were incorporating concepts of adaptation to the environment and natural selection established by Darwin to explain why we see variations in these subpopulations. So these works were different from previous efforts because they applied evolutionary genetic and ecological principles to identify racial or population variation rather than looking at cranial capacity and phenotypical um, differences. But controversies over race didn't end in the 1960s and continue into the present. That being said, in general, there's a sense of within physical anthropology that the earlier use of race as a unit of study is not viable. So what's changed? You know, since the 1960s, the field of physical anthropology has become increasingly specialized and includes areas such as genetics, child growth and development, primatology, paleoanthropology, and skeletal biology, as well as forensic science. In concluding, here are some of the kind of important tools that physical anthrop anthropologists have started to use since the 1960s. So one is that they take a bio biocultural and biobehavioral approach. Another is that they, they really build on Darwin's notion of evolution, and they apply this to human populations. They also look at human behavior in deep time and in evolutionary perspectives and use this information to foresee problems in contemporary societies. 
So there's this idea that the past actually has applicable um, lessons that could help us understand and prevent um, certain evolutionary processes in the present. There's also a kind of population levels perspective here. So bioanthropologists are really interested in looking at human populations rather than looking at um, racial groups. And the last kind of main thing is that biological anthropologists or physical anthropologists today really take a kind of comparative approach to human societies, as well as com comparative approaches that look at non-human primates um, and also things like mammals. So people look comparatively at dog evolution, uh, dog coevolution with humans. So all of these are kind of valuable tools that allow us to really kind of make substantial progress in terms of understanding human biological and biophysical evolution over time. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. I'll see you in our next class.